My name is David Gold. I'm one of the co-authors on the current biology paper, Canopy Flow Analysis Reveal the Advantage of Size in the Oldest Communities of Multicellular Eukaryotes. Or in other words, how is it that the first large life forms evolved on Earth? To answer that question, we're going to have to take you to the coast of Newfoundland, Canada, to a place called the Mistaken Point Ecological Reserve. Here, there are bedding plains with hundreds of fossils. Most of these organisms are collectively called rangiomorphs. They look superficially like ferns, and although they're clearly eukaryotes, we don't know exactly what kind of eukaryotes they are. What we do know is that they're made up of these small units called frondlets. These frondlets repeat themselves over and over in a fractal pattern, meaning that each branch branches, and each one of those branches branches, and each one of those branches branches for three or four orders of magnitude. These frondlets branch in different ways to create all these different forms of rangiomorphs that come in different sizes. And while scientists aren't sure what these organisms are, they hypothesize that they lived in communities on the ocean floor, and were using these branches to increase their surface area, which helped them directly absorb the nutrition they needed from the surrounding ocean water. These rangiomorph beds are preserved in deep water setting that can be ascertained from the sedimentology of the rocks themselves. So the fine-grained nature of the rock, the lack of sedimentary structure in the form of ripples, uh, all these point to very low flow. In the turbididic nature of the rocks and other interpretation of the basinal setting reveal that the rocks were deposited in deep water, that is, below the photic zone, below the level to which light penetrates the sea. And so we can infer pretty clearly that there was no light, uh, there was very limited flow. This raises an important question. If there was no light and very little flow, how did rangiomorphs compete with bacteria or microbial mats, which were abundant at the time and today are very good at absorbing nutrition from the water? In other words, what was the advantage that rangiomorphs had over bacteria by growing tall? And to really address this question, we have to really understand the processes going on in flow. We can reconstruct the community so we know that it is, has a certain density, it has a certain number of, of elements sticking up off the bottom. And it became apparent that this might not be the kind of setting that would be typically subject to interpretable using the classical sorts of flow models. It turns out there's a set of models that are associated with situations where there's lots of objects tipping up into flow. And these are called canopy flows. One of the main characters of canopy flows is that they actually slow down a set of fluid so that there are effectively two sets of fluid velocity, one within the community and one above the community. And when you have flows that are operating in parallel that are different in velocity, the faster flow effectively trips over the underlying slow flow. And so at that boundary between the two flows, you wind up having a series of very large vortices. These are called Kelvin-Helmholtz vortices, or are referred to a Kelvin-Helmholtz instability. And they produce very large eddies, and these have important ramifications for the modeling of the, of the beds and the flow over them. Canopy flows are really all around us. Fields of wheat or other grains, when they blow in the wind, uh, when there's a wind flowing over them, the same kind of thing happens. Another aspect of this is that these have found their way into art. Uh, Van Gogh was a seemingly almost fixated on the canopy flow features of waving grain, and he often represented them in the same images with these same sorts of Kelvin Helmholtz vortices in the clouds of the sky above. The canopy flow uh, operating in the rangiomorph beds produces large vertical motions associated with each of these big Kelvin Helmholtz vortices. And that in itself uh, actually mixes the community very well. This means that rangiomorphs couldn't be taking advantage of any gradients in the water column, like differences in oxygen between the sea floor and higher up, or differences in nutrients between the sea floor and higher up in the water column. So that's not the way that rangiomorphs could have been competing with bacteria for nutrition in the water. So to figure out how they were doing it, we had to move away from the community level and think about the surfaces of the rangiomorphs themselves. Uh, at very low velocities, uh, basically diffusion is quite limited. Every increment you grow up exposes you to slightly higher velocity. And uh, as a consequence, it actually almost linearly uh, with velocity, you increase uh, your uptake potential. Uh, and this has a far greater effect than the differences in the uptake 
ability of the surfaces themselves. The differences between a prokaryotic mat, which might be a little better than, say, uh, a frog skin and taking something up, that becomes uh, uh, irrelevant. So what we concluded in this paper is that these organisms, these rangiomorphs, are competing for access to flow. You know, if they're sticking up in the water column, they can take advantage of flow. And if you're a bacterial mat or you're an individual bacteria, you can't stick up in the water column. And so this gave rangiomorphs an advantage in this setting over prokaryotes. This application of canopy flows probably is going to prove to be a very important in a lot of different uh, settings. Coral bleaching, for example, uh, whether it does or doesn't happen, will be probably related to the properties going on in the boundary layer, you know, right at the surface of the organism, and those are in turn related to the flow uh, in the community. This project was a collaboration amongst members of the NASA Astrobiology Institute. To find out more about our work, visit complexlife.org.